What's up, Madridistas? This is Kian Sobani. I have great news for everybody who's going to be in Madrid for El Clasico. If you're passing through Madrid for El Clasico, come up to our El Clasico in-person, intimate, interactive preview podcast in Madrid. Myself, Kian Sobani, and Managing Madrid's Ewan McTeer, along with other journalists who I won't spoil the names, but you're going to love meeting, as well as the other Madridistas who will be in attendance. Come out. Hang out with us on Friday night for an El Clasico preview show in person. The link to book your spot is in the show notes. If you're a patron, this event is completely free. If you're not a patron, it's 10 bucks. Now, I would urge you, if you've ever been on the fence about joining Patreon and you're going to be in Madrid and you're planning on coming to this podcast, just become a patron. It's a no-brainer. It's $3 a month to join Patreon. The event is $10 for early bird tickets, so right off the bat, basically it's paid for. So join us over on patreon.com slash managingmadrid. Uh, and your ticket is completely free for this event. Link to book your spot is in the show notes. Speaking of Patreon, on Wednesday night, we are doing an exclusive post-game podcast for the Shakhtar Donetsk game. We do this for every Champions League game. If you're a patron, you get a Zoom link. You join us on the Zoom call one hour after the game. You interact with us as we record the post-game podcast. We ask, we interact with you guys. You guys ask questions. There's a chat box, and it's a ton of fun. There's video breakdown. We can't post the video bro- breakdown uh, on YouTube or on the podcast feed, obviously, because there's copyright issues. But if you're on the live Zoom feed, you'll be able to partake in that analysis. So make sure you hop on and join us over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. And just some quick housekeeping before we get to the post game show, not to overwhelm you, but we have three post game shows coming out for free tonight, which is Sunday night. So we have this one, which is a breakdown of the draw against Osasuna. We have Las Blancas and then we have Castilla. Those three podcast post game will all go up combination of Sunday night and Monday morning don't get overwhelmed just tackle it one at a time and also just want to let you know that tomorrow which is Monday Jose Perez and I are going to preview Shakhtar Lucas Perez uh, Lucas Navarrete and I uh, I don't know why I said Lucas Perez Lucas Navarrete and I are also going to an El Dia Después podcast and then over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid we have three podcasts back to back Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Thursday, Tuesday, tap us on Tuesday, Wednesday is the post-game show, and Thursday is the mailbag, and basically, I think we have another one on Friday, so I don't know, I don't know how many podcasts I just listed up, but it's basically 300 in the next four days, and we love doing this, and that's why we do it, so it's no problem on our end, but in case you feel overwhelmed, just take it one at a time, do whatever you're interested in, it's all cool, it's all good, have fun with it, and without further ado, here's the post-game show, we're going to get started with the voices of Derek Ray and Ray Hudson. Nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. Uh, wonderful lads that do a great job there. And um, worth reading about that man there. So he bet the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. Such great podcast as well. Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation. Hello and welcome to a Sunday night edition of the Managing Madrid podcast. We are here to break down, for the first time, Real Madrid have dropped points all season and it was bound to happen. Maybe predictably so, it came on the first game back after the international break. And also Suna, who played a really nicely, uh, well-oiled, good defensive deep block that was organized. They did what they could. They prevented Real Madrid from scoring more than one goal. They also played some mind games on a penalty kick, and they got two. Uh, they got a point out of it. Real Madrid dropped two points, and now Real Madrid and Barcelona are tied neck and neck. It's going to be a gripping title race till the end, I imagine, and the Clasico becomes even more important now. So, joining me is Matt Wiltsey. Matt, how are you? Hey, Kian. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. This was a strange one, and it's the end of a streak, but it it was bound to happen. It was bound to happen. We were due one of these types of games. It happened, and now the key is to make sure this isn't this doesn't repeat itself, that we don't fall into kind of a consistent poor run of form here and a poor of results. And we've got big games on the horizon, Classico in two weeks. So there's no time to feel sorry for ourselves. Madrid are going to have to pick themselves right back up, whether they want to blame it on the international break 
players just coming back from injury, i.e. Benzema, um, whatever it may be. It was it was a so-so game, but the opportunities were there to win it. Um, and Real Madrid really should have won it. I think they should have won it. Obviously, I mean, it, it also comes down to simple things like Benzema not only missed a penalty, but also missed a great chance earlier that was basically in the six-yard box that, you know, last season he would have scored with his with his eyes closed. Um, I also do think, um, having said that, while we should have won it and you look at this game and you look at the XG and, you know, obviously that's a metric we often look at in terms of who deserved to win or who deserved, who didn't deserve to win. We also, I don't think, played very well. And I think there was a rust from certain players. It's not like we were firing on all cylinders. It's not like we dominated this game. I I don't think this is this was necessarily a case of like you know if you replay this game nine times out of ten you win you win them. Um, I also I do think that there was a little bit more to this, and I think we struggled to create chances. Now, having said that, this has been a grind for Real Madrid and La Liga, and quite frankly, I mean I think even if you go to our title challengers, you know, just uh, uh, in Barcelona, they also had to endure it and play a pretty ugly game yesterday and I think this is going to be there's going to be these games in La Liga there's going to be games where you dominate and you play well there are going to be games where the second half you go to another gear and you do well there are going to be games like this that are inevitable that you you will drop points you can't go through an entire league campaign completely perfect I think if you look at the process of this there was uh maybe some forced passes and forced dribbles from our attackers and midfielders I think there was clearly not much space. I think Osasuna did, did well to plug the lanes. They plugged the flanks. They did well to defend in their, you can call it, I, I would call it a 4-4-2 block, but it kind of morphs into 5-4-1, 4-4-2 sometimes. It depends where they are, but they're pretty hedged back into a low block, and it's hard to break that break that down. Um, we can start with the starting lineup, though, Matt, and you know, I'm curious to know what your takeaway from the starting lineup was. I think if you look at it, you know, the one, I guess, surprise was Danny Ceballos. We knew Modric was injured. He wasn't going to play this game. Uh, so the options are Fede Valverde, who's been in blitzing form, or um, Eduardo Camavinga. I think maybe Camavinga would have made sense to start in a, in a lot of ways. I also think Fede Valverde, you know, the international, the South Americans who go on international break tend to have a little bit more mileage on them when they come back. And... You know, so I can understand that one. I also think on merit, based on merit alone, Danny Ceballos deserved to start. I mean, he has played well this season. Whether he played well in this game is a different discussion. I don't think he was nearly as bad as some people made it out to be. I think he played some nice vertical passes and he at least was trying to do the right things. I also think by extension, a lot of the starters in general tend to suffer this season just for the sheer fact that the game stake doesn't suit them as much as it does for the bench players coming in. So often, regardless of who starts and who comes in, it, it in a lot of ways matters more who comes in and what the game state is at that at that point. And unfortunately for, for us today, the game state was that Osasuna had uh, lost a player and they were basically desperately trying to hold their draw. And so by extension, they went into an even deeper block and tried to hold on. I think that was actually in some ways harder to attack than it was when it was 11 men. So why don't we start with the starting lineup? What were your thoughts on it? And did it make sense to start Ceballos in a game like this? I, I was good with the starting lineup. I liked it. I think it does make sense to start Ceballos in a game like this. You obviously lost Luka Modric. And what does he provide? He provides um, kind of cre- not only does he provide the two-way presence, but he provides that little bit of creativity, that guy that can provide produce the magic pass to kind of unlock a defense and we know going against Osasuna that they're probably going to try and sit deep and play on the counter um, and if you remember it was against Osasuna away in Pamplona uh, last season at the end of the season that Danny Sabas played a fantastic game uh, one of his one of his best games and he and he had the opportunity to start so for me it ticked all the boxes it made sense I think um like on paper, that, that lineup I had absolutely no, no issues with. I like Tony. Um, obviously, Andre Lunin gets to start because Courtois is forced out with injury. And I think even though even though this was a poor game and a frustrating game, I you mentioned earlier that um, 
we struggled to create opportunities. I don't know. I don't know that we did. I think we I think we created enough. We created enough to win this game. We created enough to score. Our XG was what 2.5, but that doesn't even consider um the opportunities. Think back to the Carver some of Carver Hall's crosses that nobody managed to get a shot off of. Mendy had a great first time cross in the first half. In a similar situation. Nobody managed to get a get a touch on it. Like those types of things don't even show up on the expected goals. Um and I think we did more than enough to win this game. Uh, you, when you consider the penalty as well, like everything was there. Yes, we didn't play great, and yes, this this match was really frustrating at times. But I do think we created enough opportunity. So I think I mean there was a flurry towards the end, like almost predictably there was a flurry at the end where I really think we should have scored from that flurry because it wasn't just that penalty. It was the 93rd minute where Benzema also has that chance, like just on the six yard box from a header. And then you had that Mariano had a, had a pretty good ch- chance in the 91st minute. Then you had um, obviously the Benzema penalty, which he, you know, he hit the crossbar with. In the first half, I think it was a little bit fewer and far between. Now, what I will say about the first half is like you mentioned some of those crosses, is, and I think it's worth pointing out that Carvajal's crossing has been underrated his whole career. He put in several really dangerous balls diagonally into the box that. You know, one. I did you mention the one where basically I I think this one was in the first half where it basically just lands on Rudiger's head and Rudiger I think just can't connect with it. Maybe it just falls on the back of his neck or his shoulders or something. And that was a beautiful ball. I also was impressed for our first like three set pieces. We were being pre- being pretty creative with our set piece routines. We weren't just whipping corners and we were actually playing these short balls in. And the last final ball was slightly over hit. Otherwise, I think we're looking at creating some good chances there. So you are correct, I think, in saying that there are some things, there are good, decent offensive sequences that didn't show up on the stat sheet. Um, I think in a game like this, too, there is some difficulty in create in playing the way you want to play. And the way you want to play, if you're Real Madrid, is always trying to take advantage of the space and behind the defensive line. That's why way, why the, the way Atletico Madrid faced us was ideal in the first half at the Metropolitano. And because they just left so much space for our runners, and, we, and they also gave space on and time on the ball to Chuo Many and um, Modric and Cruz. I think what Osasuna did in this game is that they didn't necessarily prevent Chuo Many and Cruz to hit passes, but what they did do was they totally limited the space that was available to run into. Arasate spoke about this before the game in the pregame press conference that like you have to really choose where you give Real Madrid the space. You can either go high and press them, but if you do that, your pressing has to be perfect. Um, or you can basically choose to, you know, plug the space a little bit deeper. And I think he made the correct call to do the latter. Um, I also think, again, you just didn't have enough transition opportunities. I, I, I Osasuna did this weird thing on their goal kicks in the first half where they sent their entire team up the field and hit a long ball. And they basically left all it took was remember that chance where it was almost a goal of the season where either Rudiger or Alaba heads it out of the back and then Vinicius runs up the field and Benzema has that volley which goes just wide of the far post in the first half oh yeah yeah which was an incredible goal that was an example of that but that was like the really only the, the only real transition opportunity we had so i don't know i i, I suppose Matt, i guess where we will agree on is that there was a lack of sharpness in front of goal that I think you win last season if you if this is pre- presented in front of you. Like it's so funny. Like you look at Kike's goal that was an it was a point zero two on the XG chart, and that's like a that's a classic goal that Benzema scores, right? Not what Kike scores. And and right now the difference right now is that Benzema's underperforming his XG, and and he wasn't for a long time. Yeah, I think you're right. At the end of the day, like finishing touch just wasn't there for us today. And but that's what makes me not worried because I think that will will this isn't going to be something that I feel will be repetitive. Our players are too good. I agree with um, you. They're too clinical when you give them that amount of chances. Like they'll they'll figure it out. And I think this is kind of one of those games. We see it every single year where either a goalkeeper has 
it lights out and just makes unbelievable saves and or we just don't have our shooting boots on and I think this is one of these games and again we were due for it like this is the best start to a season we've had in what 50 60 years or something so and it yet was even still I, even we were, still we Matt kind of the bit- meltdown the meltdown even still <laughs> yeah. is there right was, yeah. they were ready to pounce yeah. everybody um you're right I, yeah you don't there's no season that doesn't have games like this no season at all yeah like it's it's impossible yeah. these games exist um i i guess the and i saw your tweet on this so this is a bit of a rhetorical question i guess because i know your answer but i would like you to verbalize it on the podcast um are you worried about karim benzema I'm not worried at all. I don't think this is a situation where Benzema is suddenly declining. Like when it comes to players of that age, when they decline, it's it's pretty apparent physically. And with Benzema, I don't see any sign of physical decline. Like you you don't see it with Modric, who's the same age. Um, but like you can really see a different player, Cristiano, versus even just three, four years ago. Um, and Benzema, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. He just needs to get match rhythm. He needs to start scoring goals. Once he gets a few, um, gets his confidence up and just gets the form flowing, he'll be fine. Everything will come together, and I'm confident that he'll have another really, really strong season. It may not be quite as good as last season um, because that will probably be the best season he ever produces in in his life. But I think it'll still be another fantastic season from Benzema. And I'm not worried. I'm not worried about him. And I think it will be. Somebody asked me, that Benzema at 70%, is that enough? I think it is. Like 70% of what he did last year. I, I think it is. I think we've got, we've seen while Benzema was out that we do have players who can pick up the slack. Vinicius will continue to pick up the goal scoring load. Rodrigo is taking leave. Fede is now scoring goals. Like, as long as that type of form continues then yeah, I think we, we don't have to be as reliant on Benzema this year. That's basically my, that was my take earlier in the season when this question arose, like before he got injured against Celtic, this was this was a question too, because he hasn't started the season off to the same hot start he has in the last couple. And that was my take. It's like, because in all of these games where he's not scoring, he's involved, he's not ghosting, he's not he's not shying away, he's not trying to hide anywhere he's very active he's there and what he's what he's missing is just that sharpness in front of goal and I I think this one you could excuse it in a way that like you know well he just this was his first game back since that Celtic game and uh you know he'll be he'll be fine now if if months pass by and he's still like this then I suppose we were wrong but I think as of right now I would my 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 hunch and based on history with previous great players you don't lose this overnight like that and uh i i'm I'm still confident in his ability to bounce back and be really productive um let's break down the first goal i guess if there is anything to break down then we can get into some of the the other little details of the game the wrinkles much debate i suppose at least on on television whether this was considered offside or not what take do you have on this Honestly, I could see this go either way. Uh, I really could. I think Millie, t- or not Millie, t- uh, Rudiger looks like he might be involved in the player, at least kind of throw, throwing Herrera off. So I could see it go either way. I also could see the viewpoint of the referee and what was ultimately called that this was a goal. Um, just because obviously they don't touch it. Obviously they're they're not really that close to making contact they're just kind of in line of sight but um yeah i i, I honestly could see it either way what did, what did, what did you make of it well there there are some rules in football that are black and white that are objective um off offside i mean offside they've tried to make it objective and not uh based on interpretation the handball is one of the worst in football because it's completely open to interpretation. No matter how much they twist the rule, every referee just has their own way of dealing with it. This particular one in the laws of the game is a little bit fuzzy, and it's going to be down to how the referee sees it. Because in the rule book, it says a player is offside, even if they don't touch the ball, if they are in the line of sight. 
and I, you know, I, there, there is one angle in this where I think it shows Rudiger in the line of sight of Sergio Herrera and other angles that show that maybe that's not the case. And I think the referee just has to make a call. So I could also go either way. Um, I think there are, and it seems like there wasn't a consensus on TV either. So I, you know, um, and then I've seen articles that have been written and say it was absolutely onside and other people say it was offside. But, you know, it's, I think this is fine if it stands. If you were to tweak this rule, would you tweak it to reward it so that, um, like, would is there a world where it would make sense to just say it's only offside if you touch it? Or is that is that kind of meddling with the laws a little bit too much? I think it's I think it's meddling too much. I don't know. I mean, I feel like we don't run into this controversy with this rule that much. Like compared to the handball rule, I feel like we run into it that much that I don't know that I'd change anything. Like you're never going to you're never going to have that perfect on these rules that aren't as clear as black and white. Like you're never going to find that perfect gray space. So I think you just have to kind of roll with it as is. What, from a tactical perspective, it could be individual, it could be positional, it could be anything collective. What stood out for me the first from the first half that was the most interesting talking point? You mentioned it earlier. I really liked the set pieces, in particular, the corner kicks. And not only were they short, but they were really quick. So as soon as we, as soon as the corner kick was called, we got there and played the pass as quickly as possible. And so I like that. It, it doesn't get the opposition team time to set up in position. And when, when they do see the balls in play, they have, they often move towards the, the ball carrier. And so that can sometimes create space. Um, and even if a shot's like when we play towards the top of the box, even if a shot's not on, we usually have the ability to just rotate it back out and get across. And so I, I liked it. Uh, it obviously only backfired once when I think Carvajal misplaced uh, or just completely with the shot at the top of the box and then Osasuna countered and, and nearly scored. But yep. Rudiger did a fantastic job of, of sweeping that up. And I thought this was probably Rudiger's best game so far in a Real Madrid shirt. He was, he was fantastic. I thought 1v1 defending just untouchable, swept everything up. His long distance passing, the big diagonals was um, really, he really um, hit those well. And I think that was kind of a tactical wrinkle I liked was both he and Cruz in particular did it well. I think many had a couple good passes, but they were just hitting dime, long distance, big diagonal passes. And you talked about how um, Sasuna wanted to sit back and wanted to prevent Real Madrid from having certain spaces in this game to make it more difficult. Well, I think the spaces that they were willing to give were the weak side, the weak side uh, winger. And so oftentimes, I mean, you give Cruz ability to pick up his head and find that pass. He's going to hit it every single time. And um, he found Carvajal and Vinicius in particular, just time and time again with perfectly weighted passes right into their right into their stride. Um, and that's why, I was really surprised with Ancelotti's decision to take Cruz out because I thought he was one of the best players on the pitch. Look afterwards um, at some of the stats, and I don't want to butcher this person's profile name, so I'll look it up real quick. But um, from uh, marker stats on on Twitter, they provide kind of um, expected goals, expected threat, um, even individual player like statistics and stuff like that. And, Tony Cruz was far and away um, Real Madrid's best player in terms of producing the largest expected threat from this from this game, um, and it, it clearly came from his long range passing. Um, he, Rodrigo, and Carvajal stood out in, in this department, and I was just surprised at Ancelotti's decision to take him out because not only do I think we lost a bit of control, we went into that Zidane like four two four formation and like even a three five two at one point or whatever you want to call it th- three two five um it just felt it got way too chaotic and we've seen that we've seen that in previous seasons where you lose all control of the game you just start spamming crosses and it really it's actually easier proposition def- defenses to 
to clear those out and deal with that than it is kind of like what you saw with um, Ben winning the, the penalty kick. Like Kavinga picks up the ball from deep, picks his head up. Benzema makes a great run off the shoulder of the center back and chips in a ball into the box. Like that type of stuff doesn't happen anymore when you go 4 2 4. So um, I think Enchilada got, I think, I don't know. I, it's hard to criticize him, criticize him when he's done so well with his substitutions this year, but I think in this one he got it wrong. Yeah, that's an, I, I want to bring that forward for a second. Uh, I also just want to go back to the set piece point. I think a lot of people, um, seem to to not like our set pieces and i think that's part of the partly because they weren't ex- executed to a t and i think it all came unraveling to the one you mentioned where cruz drives that one kind of low carvajal miss hits it or or loses at the top of the box and and also soon to come the other way we we left a lot of space in behind that one but again i think it was just like little fine details for not executing the set piece at the end but i think overall the ideas were imaginative and good and i think i would like to see more of that moving forward so with and i also think we pretty much limited osasuna the other way as well i mean again i think kike's goal was a, a freak goal abde gave us some problems where he beat rodrigo and carvajal a couple times there and also swapped fl- flanks he was dangerous on in transition but other than that i think we did well to defend them with Regards to the subs, I think that's interesting because I did want to ask you about this. Um, and Ancelot, like Ancelot, Ancelot, did not go too deep on it in the post game, but you know he was asked like you know why not Hazard instead of Mariano or something to that effect, and he he basically <laughs> Matt's shaking his head uh, for those who are not watching this on YouTube. But so, uh, but what he said was that you know well it's because. Hazard wouldn't. It's not a game for Hazard. We wanted to put Mariano in there to beat crosses, and basically this is what it turned into. Kind of like you know, this is classic. Uh, this is what Zidane would do often when he needed to go late, just send everyone in the box and start crossing. Which is not. I know it's it's kind of like it's an easy thing to make fun of, but at the same time, it's one of the best ways to break a low block is to cross it. I mean, a, a lot of coaches have been on record about this. There's. It's an interesting debate because, like, I personally, my belief has always been the way to score is not to sub off all your defenders and midfielders and to put attackers on. I think that, um, I think that kind of it, it makes you a little bit more predictable than than it would be if you had some creative midfielders in the mix there as well. It also makes uh, it a lot of people will make similar runs. What it does give you, I guess, is numerical superiority in the box. But again, when you have 10 Osasuna players in the box um, defending, it, it's going to be hard. This hap- This was a huge debate when, unlike Reichardt's last year at Barca, he would do this a lot where he would sub out midfielders and defenders and put on like five, six attackers to try to score a goal. And then would, like almost never would work. And uh, I'm surprised. I'm, I've, this is the first time I remember anything like this. I mean, this is... We joked on this on the Managing Major Twitter account. This is like our formation from the 1960 European Cup final where it's like two defenders, seven attackers, your attacking line, like the starting 11 literally has like six players in attack. Um, so at one point, just to do to summarize, we had Mariano, Benzema, Rodrigo, Vinicius, Asensio, and then I guess you had a Fede Camavinga double pivot. But at that point, Kamavinga was almost playing left back the whole time because Mendy was also gone and, and um, Militao was also basically playing striker the whole time he was on the field. So it was an interesting, I guess, wrinkle. But hey, um, there have been there were games in the past where you know Ramos would save us with a header or Casemiro would save us with a header in the box. And in this game, to be fair, we did have we we did nearly score from that flurry at the end, but we just we just kind of couldn't. So. Yeah, I mean, what what would you have done maybe a little differently? Well, I definitely wouldn't have taken out Cruz. Like, even if you wanted to do, like, the four two four formation, I would have kept Cruz in um, regardless because at least he gives you a little bit more control than any of the other midfielders. That being said, I think Kamavinga was actually very, very good um, as a substitute, and he obviously played the pass to Benzema for the penalty kick, um, and he – did a couple of those kind of chip through balls um, to to good effect. And so I thought he was actually um, really good almost in a quarterback role, which we sometimes have 
called out as a knock on him in terms of like his progressive passing, his vertical passing, uh, and his overall ability to control a game. But I think in this particular meal appearance, he did really well in that regard. So I liked Kamavinga, uh, but I would have Cruz on and I just I pers- I'm with you. Like I personally wouldn't have made the change to the formation. I think you just be patient. Um, maybe you want to, if he wanted to put a sense on, I wasn't like huge on that, but if it seems Carla wants to integrate him more, so I would have just taken out Rodrigo then. Um, and if he wanted to put Valverde on, then put him in for Ceballos, which I think he originally did. Um, just keep the Valverde, Camavinga, Cruz midfield, uh, and then plug in Asensio on the, on the right. It would have been a nice game to have Lucas Vazquez if you weren't feeling like you were getting enough Carvajal if he was tired at the end. Um, but otherwise, I would have kept, I would have kept things pretty similar and just been patient. Like trust the team to break them down. Trust a guy like Karim Benzema to bounce back from missing the penalty and ultimately score the game winner, which he would have done. I mean, that offsides call was very, very close. Um, so he did actually end up put, put the ball on the back of that, but it was called for just not even an inch probably offsides. Vasquez was, uh, is not back yet from injury. Um, I don't think he was in the squad. But uh, Right, yeah. Yeah, I'm Cam- just saying if he was available. Yeah, yeah. C- Kamavinga, I mean... The ball to Benzema that led to the penalty was so beautiful. It was just perfectly weighted uh, right over the top. And, uh, yeah, it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous pass. Ancelotti's wording after the game was, quote, the changes were to introduce fresh ideas. So he didn't really necessarily elaborate on that more, but he just felt like, you know, maybe different players will just do different things. Kamavinka certainly did bring that. I think Fede Valverde, it's Fede Valverde in a double pivot where he's that deep and he's not he can't really make the runs he normally does because there's six players ahead of him. I don't know how effective he is in that role. I think from that position, maybe Cruz makes more sense, especially if you're really not worried about transition defense at all uh, because you're not getting threatened, really, especially after Abde came off in the second half. There wasn't much to worry about. So... Yeah, these are all valid points. Like you said, like you know, it's easy to sit here and kind of play armchair manager or whatever. At the same time, um, you know, there was enough chances to win this game, and you know, you move on. Uh, it, I, I think the frustration, in large part, though, and and maybe some of the collective anxiety, is that is not is is like performance aside, is that you really need every point you can get this season because you, the margin of error against Barcelona is going to be really small. So. To, to to drop the two points here, it, it's frustrating. But hey, look, I mean, we've we've won all our games until now. We've won difficult games, and you know, so we got some of the difficult games on our schedule out of the way. And um, it's the schedule for October is still pretty crazy. There's a lot of difficult games left, so we'll see how we handle this. Um, all right, where do you, where do you want to jump to now? Um. What did you make of Chua Manny's performance? Because I've seen different different outlooks on it. Um, I again, I don't think I think everyone got pretty pretty criticized in this game. I think a lot of people didn't feel like there were there was good production from the midfielders. I think even people were critical of Cruz. I don't know what you want necessarily him to do in a game like this. I understand that he wasn't good. I, I'm not going to necessarily make a pass for him, but I also don't like he like Kroos and too many both like their their passing was pretty good in this game, um, and they're hitting their outlets. And I think I mean like Kroos got criticized twelve or thirteen long balls, and too many um, had a had a had a pretty good passing game. I just I think he was just quiet. Like he didn't do too much. There wasn't much for him to do. I think he got frustrated. I think there was a correct wrinkle that when Real Madrid had the ball, Cruz would kind of get deeper, go deeper coming out of the back and too many would go forward. And then on defense, it would switch too many would go deeper. Cruz would go a little bit more advanced. I just don't think he did much, but I also, I'm not going to, I'm not going to blame this game on him when really the reality was there was just no space to work with. And, they were hitting passes, but you know, this comes down to a lot of it. Come will come down to efficiency, and I and the team didn't have that. But I certainly didn't pinpoint too many. 
I saw on social media that there was an article on Chu Many that basically he just had a bad performance ex- exclusively on him, which I thought was out insane. Yeah, I wouldn't pinpoint him, but maybe I'm a bit more critical than you are of his performance. I just didn't. I I thought he was. I thought this was probably his worst game, even worse than his debut. Um, probably was. And yeah, and I think like think about the commentators called it out where like when Benzema played him a pass back and like both he and Cruz were thought it was for them. And like, I felt like there were just kind of a lot of miss concentration and just opportunities where he wasn't fully locked in. And Ancelotti yanked him immediately after when he made a, a poor pass in the second half that um, was stolen right away from by Osasuna. And instead of reacting, like, thing what are the, what's the one quote coaches always tell you like it's not that you made a mistake it's your behavior immediately after a mistake like what do you do what's the first thing you do after a mistake mm-hmm. and i feel like this isn't true of two of many so i'm not trying to vilify him or like paint him to have a poor attitude or anything like that but in this in this particular game he, and then after that moment he literally just threw his hands up and started walking and like he was didn't when he came was as soon as trans yeah so it wasn't for me. I think it was a, a really poor game. I think he, I think he was pissed because he knew he played poorly, um, and he did have some nice passes, especially some nice uh, big diagonal long balls like Cruz and Rudiger did. But other than that, I was, I just felt like I, I even felt like because I was really in the first half watching the team um, defensively in their defensive shape, and. For large stretches of the mat, especially the first 10 minutes, Osasuna had a lot of the ball. Um, and I felt like our midfield was a little bit disjointed and Chumeni wasn't covering the same spaces that you would normally see Casemiro cover. Like he just, he was a little bit late every single time. And I also, to kind of continue with this midfield, um, just uh, again, like I, I didn't think any of them were just awful, but just s- some small critiques like Ceballos. I love what he brings. I love his energy. I love um, he, he combines well with Rodrigo. Um, he interchanges positions well. He just under his touch is so fluid and smooth. But in this one, I felt like there were times where he would press and it wasn't the right moment to press. Like the team should just drop in, collect their shape. And he would bring the team out of shape trying to press. And maybe one or one other player would go with him, but not the whole team. And so we were completely disjointed. And it wasn't really an opportunity to press because he started his pressing sequence late. And when you start your pressing sequence late, like very rarely are you in the right position or, or do you have enough time to get to the opposition player and actually hound them and, and make trouble for them. So... Um, in this, there were a couple of times I felt like that, especially in the first half. And I was just like, ah, Ceballos, is that, is that really the right moment to, to be pressing? So it, just a couple of things there that you said, I think were important. And I, and I think on, on Chu many, there were a couple of things in my notes that positionally he did not cover zone 14. Um, and I, and by, by, by that, I mean like he was there, but he also let players slip behind him undetected. And with Ceballos, I, I thought the reason I liked Ceballos' performance in the first half was that he seemed to be the only one who was trying to play those vertical passes and and get the ball in advanced positions in the box in during slower build up plays. You know, for in you know short distance passing was good, but again, I I don't think really <laughs> I don't think anyone was really good today. Uh, but I I guess I'll just throw something else at you, and this ties into this discussion. Um, and I suppose this something pessimistic here but games like this make me start thinking about what what the team looks like after the world cup if an international break gets us coming back like this i was um this morning i was writing about michael laudrup for my book and uh i came across something he said back in 1994 where he was taught like basically when he went to real madrid from barcelona he said that Every single World Cup, players come back out of form. And he was talking about the 1995, 1994 World Cup, and he was basically saying that's part of the reason why Barcelona collapsed, apart from like me leaving. like They came back from that World Cup pretty bad. And I was just thinking about, like, oh, that seems to be just still true. And 
this one being in the middle of the season, I know it's been a subject of much discussion and we've talked about it a lot, but it's games like this that I start to remember like, yeah, I'm kind of worried about what team looks like coming back from the World Cup. Pretty worried. So, so I, yeah. yeah. I mean, the the last World Cup was when we saw probably our worst, one of our worst ever seasons in the last, what, five, six year probably more than that uh where we went through Lopetegui, Solari and Zidane yeah um but I think what gives me a little bit more comfort versus that season is Pindis and the fact that Ancelotti has um put in kind of a rotational setup to start the season um so that does give me a little bit more faith and it's not like all our I don't think despite getting called up um this last up for France. I don't think he's going to go to the World Cup. They had injuries and he actually played really poorly for France over the international break and uh, Deschamps pulled an Ancelotti and yanked him off at halftime. So I don't, I like, I think a lot of guys either will, won't get called up or they may not play. Um, like Militao, it's kind of on the fence whether or not he even starts for, for Brazil. Um, so I think from that perspective, will be a little bit fortunate, but the guys that make a deep run and play like every game, yeah, we're we're gonna have to and Kareem Benzema could be one of those guys. We're just gonna have to be prepared for that. I'm kinda torn about it because on one hand I want Vinicius Jr. to lift the World Cup trophy at the end of the summer. I mean, no actually my dream is for Alfonso Davies to lift up the World Cup trophy. But if that doesn't work and if Iran doesn't lift it after that, I would like Alfonso I I'd like Vinicius Jr. to Lifted are quite frankly Benzema or you know whoever and the Real Madrid players. On the other side, I would like none of them to go. I would just like to bubble wrap them all and just keep them home, um, and just not have them play in the World Cup. But yeah, um, yeah, obviously, and that's the other thing that we didn't really get into when we were discussing the starting lineup. That a lot of these lineups are predetermined, and you know their scheduled rotation. Obviously, nothing is a science perfectly because. People will get injured. You have to change your plans. You have to be flexible, etc. But you know, I'm sure there was some method to also Sabio starting. And you know, we ha- we're playing like two games a week from now until basically the World Cup. So there's going to be. It doesn't really matter who starts or who, who finishes this, the games at this point. Everyone's going to play, and everyone's going to play at different points. Um, do we want to talk about the performances of Rodrigo and Vinicius on the wings? Yeah. Um. It's hard to. I feel like Rodrigo in particular, it's hard to nail down what I think about his performance. I I didn't think he was bad. I just didn't feel like he really put his stamp on the game. Um, And in the second half, you saw him basically completely move away from the right wing. I think it was, it may have been a tactical direction for Ancelotti because he basically gave the whole flank to Carvajal. Um, and then he stayed in a central position for most of the second half, almost as like a number 10. Um, he, he did get one good shot off out, outside the box, but other than that, I just, I felt like he failed to really put his mark on the match. And in the first half, it was good. There were good battles all over it. Like him and Juan Cruz was a good battle. I liked Vinicius versus Nacho Vidal. You had Carvajal versus Abdi. Like these were fun battles. Um, and I just, I, I now because of how well he's been playing, I just expect more from him. I guess that's what it comes down to. Um, and he wasn't bad. And like, even when he was on the ball, he did well. He put in some good crosses and stuff like that. But I just expect more from him at this point. I thought he was a mixed bag. I mean, like, he had a couple of good dribbling sequences in the first half and some good hold up play. Um, I also think, you know, there were moments where Unai Garcia defended him really well. He also got cooked by Abde at one point in the first half. He had a nice ball into Benzema in the second half. He was proactive, at least, in trying to cut in and shoot, you know, some, some good efforts. You're right. I mean, his heat map is basically symmetrical, he, you know, and I think that it's always been by design because this was actually the most he spent on the right, I think, all season. Because most of the time, he, when, even when he starts on the right on paper, he's basically on the left this year. It's been a kind of a new wrinkle. Not new, but it's been more prevalent this season for sure. Um, and on Vinicius, I think he... This is kind of like a classic Vinicius game. Um, there are moments where he forces it. He also scores a goal. He also 
you know, is really brilliant with his dribbling at times, overdoes it on other times, makes some, made a couple of wrong decisions, made a couple of right decisions. This is just the give and take of Vinicius magic. It's, you know, it, it, it's always been a bundle with him and it, and it's always a positive cost benefit analysis. I don't really have a huge problem with his performances. I mean, obviously Nacho Vidal, I think got the better of him a couple of times. Then there's other times where he just blitzes his past five defenders. And you just, I think with him, you have to just trust the process and trust the the fact that there's going to be, he's going to have a vi- high volume of stuff and not everything is going to be pulled off. But I think in the end, it's going to be usually positive with him. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I did want to get your opinion um, on, on Osasuna's goal. What did you what did you make of the breakdown if you've had the chance to kind of look at it for a second time? I haven't had the chance to go back and rewind it till like the beginning of the play to see how that part of it broke down. But just on the the play itself, I think it was just a brilliant header from Kike. Like I don't I don't think Rudiger could have defended that much better. He puts a body on him, he closes the angle down. He's not going to get there in time to get goal side of them and win the header in that situation. But in terms of defending it, you know, he, he does everything he can do to close the angle down. I don't think he anticipates that Kike just flicks it, um, with the, with the, his forehead over him and over Lunin. That's just a brilliant play from Kike. I guess the question is, should Lunin have been off his line that much? And in that case, my, I think my, where I've always had a weak point, a sticking point when it comes to analysis is goalkeepers because I just can never resonate or relate to what they're doing in there and, and can, I've never played that in my life. And so I, I don't really know how to assess that part of it. I, I think maybe he could have stayed on his line. I don't know if there was any reason for him to come out in that situation because he's not getting to that cross anyway. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I've... I Like you, I haven't seen where the play actually originates from, but I have two critiques of the team on this goal um Mm -hmm. one being the pass which i think actually came from unai garcia and osasuna but he was basically in a in a right back role and um i think it was vinicius and cruz maybe that are uh like neither one of them really is marking him and Really, it should have been Vinicius and Unai Garcia had way too much time to control the ball, pick his head up, and choose his pass. Absolutely, no one pressed him, and in that type of area, in that type of spot on the pitch, like you have to be putting pressure on the ball and you have to close him down and make it at least more difficult to get that pass off. So, criticism for Vinicius there, and then two, um, I would, I would. Um, as a as a defender, if I saw Lunin in that position, I would be pissed. Like I, I think he got his positioning wrong. I think he got his angle wrong. He was too far off his line and too far hedged to the left side of the goal. Um, so, and especially for a goalkeeper like Lunin, where he doesn't have a size advantage, you have to get your positioning right. You have to. Like it's it's going to be everything to his game to be an elite goalkeeper. And I think he got this one wrong. That sounds right to me. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to go back and watch it and see where origins. Because I always like to go and see where the origin point is. But you know, plays like this, yeah. I think you have to you have to prevent the cross from coming in or at least close the angle. And given that Osasuna did not have that many attacks, I mean, you should be dealing with these much better. Um, let's see. Do we want to talk about? I mean, the, I guess here are the players we did not really talk about. Alaba, Carvajal. Uh, might be the only ones. Mendy. Mendy and Alaba were doing that thing where they swap pretty regularly. Uh, I thought Mendy at least was proactive in this game in the first half, especially where he makes good underlap and overlap runs. The final ball is a different question, but at least he was making those runs and in other games he doesn't. Carvajal, I thought was actually pretty good. I mean, considering that he put in some really good crosses and he was important tracking and, and stopping several breaks that Osasuna had. What do you have? Yeah, I think, honestly, I think Abdi is one of the best um, players in the league in 1v1, like isolated 1v1 situations. Um, 
he is so difficult to defend. I put him right up there with Vinicius and Dembele in terms of um, how difficult he is to defend off the dribble. Like if you, if he corners you, isolates you as a fullback 1v1, that's very, very difficult to defend against him. Um, and I think Carvajal got turned around a couple times, but he also defended, he also won those duels a couple times. So I thought overall, um, on the balance of things, he did well to handle Abdi. And then um, he was playing so far forward, especially in the second half, that Abdi basically had to play as a as a wing back. And obviously that's not where he's going to excel. And so I think Carvajal's movement and just his uh, desire to push forward and contribute to the attack pinned Abdi back and pinned Osuna back. And he had some great crosses, like we talked about, some really tantalizing cross- crosses that Benzema, one of them he should have put away. Um, and overall, yeah, I thought it was a good Carvalho game. I wouldn't have taken him out. Alaba was, I I just think the world of Alaba. I think he was solid in this one again. And maybe he didn't contribute much as we would have wanted when he moved to left back. But what I love what Alaba does, and is kind of under the radar is every single time he makes a pass, he immediately does some sort of movement, whether it be an underlap or getting around Mendy or just dropping off. But he has like this urgency as soon as he passes it to to create a new passing angle for the person he just passed it to. Um, And I love that about his game. It kind of is subtle and you may not notice it if you're not watching him closely, but he just is so focused uh, and, and has so much intent when... He makes a pass and then just immediately knows that he has to make some sort of movement to create a new passing angle for whoever he gave it to. So I love that about Alaba's game. And by extension, I think Mendy has always been good at recognizing what Alaba is doing to make sure he's in the right spots to cover for him as well. I think that's a really good synergy that those two have together. Um, Do you have anything else? Now is the time or forever hold your peace. Um, Just a little bit more on the subs. Obviously, we didn't talk much about Asensio, I didn't think he really brought anything to the table. He had 11 touches. That's it. Um, he did produce one, I thought, great cross right at the end of the game uh, from the left-hand side of the pitch on his left foot. Uh, we needed somebody to kind of take hold and finally put the ball in there if we were going to throw Mariano on. And so he finally was one of those guys to cross it. Um, and Mariano did connect with it, but just not enough to to convert it into a real opportunity. And I thought, like, all things, like, Marano was brought on to win crosses and win headers, and he did get on the end of that Fede Valverde chance, that driven cross from the right. I think you could kind of criticize him, though, that and say, like, you got to score that. Like, he, I think you give him credit for connecting with it. He comes really, really close. But for I like Marano, that should be his bread and butter. I think he's got to score that. I will say this about Mariano. For someone who doesn't play much, what always holds true about him is when he's on the field, you know he's there. You just know he's there. Yeah. He's going to throw his body around and just make his presence felt. I, yeah. I will question his footballing IQ and <laughs> forever, but that guy works to get into position to try to get on the ends of crosses and, and, and balls, and you got to respect that grind at the very least. Um I don't have anything else. On one the question for you. Yeah. Uh, one question for you that I see floating around, and I think I know your answer already, but I got to ask it. Um, obviously, Benzema missed his third penalty against um, Osasuna. It's his fourth penalty he's missed in 2022. Do you take him off penalties? No. I I agree with Ancelotti after the game where he, uh, I think I closed his quote tab now, but. Um, he said something along the lines of like, I could I could have you know asked someone else to take it, but Benzema was our best shooter, and you have to keep letting him shoot. You know, I I've never like when a player is that great, you have to let him. Th- this is the classic like NBA shoot through the, shoot through the slump. The moment yeah. you stop shooting, you lose your confidence altogether. You can't. The way to get confidence back is not to stop shooting. Like he's not going to get more confidence if someone else steps up and takes that penalty. You know what I mean? So I yeah. I also this is a weird thing to say and this is, might be too voodoo I guess but it kind of it seems like more of an Osasuna curse more than a penalty curse. <laughs> you know he's missed 
Sam Leverage tweeted this out uh, after the game that Benzema's missed five penalties in his career. Three of them have come against Osasuna in this calendar year. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to like say definitively, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was at least in the back of his mind where Sergio Herrera talking shit as he was taking the penalty. It wasn't a terribly struck penalty, at least. like He just he just smacked it against the bar. I think he was just trying to go for the roof of the net. But I'm sure like he probably... I don't know. I think he scores that against another team. I think this was in the back. Yeah, I think it's... Game. I think it's the same. Like, you always hear players um, talk about how, like, they have an opponent they, they always score against and they love playing against because they always score against them. Um, and it's because, like... I think your your mind just associates that team and think about like kind of okay I I always score against them you have like that positive momentum that positive feeling going into it and it's kind of the reverse in this situation where oh as soon as the team I missed two penalties again like you kind of think back to that and it's in the back of your mind so like, yeah and so I think that that holds true here and I'm with you I wouldn't I wouldn't take him off penalties no chance like this is the same guy that scored a Panenka against uh city at the at the had to like the game after to I put think. real madrid yeah so there's there's no chance like he's he's our guy uh i fully trust benzema um all right matt we're going to do some patron shout outs and then wrap it up so as i have mentioned in the intro of the show uh we have jam-packed calendar we got we got two post-game shows from today this uh, in addition to this one. So this is the third one. So this one, we got Las Blancas. Then we got Real Madrid Castilla post-game show. That's all for free on Sunday night slash Monday morning. Then uh, tomorrow, Jose and I are and Lucas and I are recording a podcast. Tuesday night, Matt and I are doing Tuesday Tapas over on Patreon.com slash Managing Madrid. I'm sure at the very least, we're going to talk about Florentino Perez's quotes at the annual general meeting today, which were very interesting. Uh, and in addition to that, there were also games this weekend that featured Real Madrid players or or players who are who we are um, interested in. Let's let's put it that way. We have we have the rights still uh, and and certain you know yeah you know what I mean loan players and players we have rights to. And then on Wednesday night it's the post game show for Shakhtar Donetsk. That's a Zoom link for patrons over on patreoncom Madrid. If you're a patron, you get a Zoom link. And one hour after the game, you join us on Zoom to break down that game. We do this for every Champions League game now. Like, moving, like this is our new rule. Big game, small game. If it's a Champions League game, it's a live Zoom podcast over on Patreon.com slash Managing Madrid. That being said, we got to give a shout-out to our patrons. Um, if you pledge $10 or more, you get a specific shout-out on the podcast in addition to getting guaranteed responses to your questions. So shout-out to Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Way Pairing, Wamik Jamal, Tobias Arroyo Bachar, Tarek Gokdas, Talib Salhab, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Damala, Sujai Wani, Sumanchu Singh, Sheikh Atiri, Shamil, Shabaz Sharapov, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorsano, Samuel Lee Justin, Samir Z, Said Mahad, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Rodrigo Palmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Patrick Odaya Fadi, Oscar Barrera, Nico <coughs> Z- Sorry. Oscar Barrera, Nicholas Zapatero Zubiare, Nicholas Moller, um, Nick Ribeiro, Mowgli, MJ Diego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lex, Logan Stahl, Leon Savernakis, Kunal Tilakar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, Jeff Thurston, Jason Fitz, Ian Marley, Graham Gerard, Gary Kohut, Frederick Rantakiro, Frederick Sundros, Faisal Hamdan, S.A. Davisito, Elo Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Con P., Christian Toff, Christian Acosta, Charles Williams, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Ashik Pashar, Armin Gashi, Armando L., Antons Rudenko, Anirud Singh, Ananya Kumar, Alex Thyberg, Al, Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adar Zalukovic, Adam Dorsey, Bella Chow, Varun, Ramtin Magrur, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. Love you guys all. Thank you so much. Matt, thank you. We'll catch you on Tuesday, over on t- Tuesday Tapas. And appreciate you all. Thanks for listening. Take care. Peace. Yep. Take care.